So we know that there are important ways to decrease ovarian cancer risk when anyone has a genetic mutation, such as a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, or some of the other mutations that we now know to be um, important with a less high increased risk, such as RAD51, C, and D. It's important to discuss all of this with either uh, your gynecologic oncologist or your cancer genetics doctor, and they'll talk to you about strategies for, quote, surveillance um, before consideration of a risk-reducing surgery. But ultimately, we know that the most effective way to most dramatically decrease your cancer risk is with a risk-reducing surgery. However, we recognize that that affects people's fertility and puts you into early surgical menopause. So the timing of that differs a little bit by what genetic mutation the patient has and their family planning goals. For women who are not yet ready for risk-reducing surgery, certainly continuing with at least annual visits and often alternating those every six months also with a GYN oncologist, can be incredibly helpful to monitor for symptoms, new exam findings, and discuss preparation for what risk-reducing surgery looks like. We often offer surveillance ultrasound, although it really isn't truly the word surveillance. Surveillance really means being able to do some sort of test that identifies a precancerous lesion that you can intervene on before it becomes a cancer, like a colonoscopy. Unfortunately, we do not have any true surveillance strategies for ovarian cancer. What ultrasound can do is potentially identify something that is already a cancer, but maybe is at an earlier stage because you've looked at it sooner and more frequently. What it also can do, however, is have a lot of false positives. So there can be complex cysts that are identified that are not a cancer but can sometimes understandably cause a lot of stress or anxiety or even cause decisions for an earlier surgery. So we always feel like it's really important to discuss you know, both sides of what can be identified on an ultrasound, especially because these ultrasounds are typically on women who are still ovulating, for which cysts on the ovaries are normal. You are going to find cysts for someone who's ovulating. It just means your ovaries are working. What we don't want those to look like are very solid, very concerning lesions. We do know that ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tubes. Unfortunately, that's a microscopic initiation of this precancerous or cancerous process. And as of now, although we are certainly researching ways to identify it, we really don't have any good true surveillance strategies. That's why ultimately at the age range as per whatever someone's genetic mutation is, somewhere between 35, 40 or 40, 45, or even 45 to 50, it's recommended to have risk-reducing surgery for removal of both the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. So the decision for preventative risk-reducing surgery is certainly a big one that nobody takes lightly. We understand that there are many medical and even surgical factors that go into when someone should have a surgery, what their risks are about surgery. For instance, if you're someone that has multiple prior abdominal surgeries, your risk of surgery may be higher than just the baseline risk. Overall though, this tends to be a safe and very effective surgery, usually done laparoscopically with small incisions, which tends to be a day surgery and usually about a week or two recovery of knowing that you've had a major surgery inside your abdomen. Often there's restrictions on things like heavy lifting and exercise for at least six weeks after to try to prevent any complications like a hernia. So for many women, deciding when is a good time to have such restrictions and at least a week or so of recovery from surgery is really important and is good to discuss timing with your surgeon. There are um, some thoughts, since we know that ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tube, that you could have an interval surgery where you remove just the fallopian tubes and then later have removal of the ovaries. While the theory behind why this is helpful certainly is strong, we do not yet, nor will we for probably many years, have data to show that that is effective for cancer risk reduction. 
what I can tell you is that it will certainly give you excellent contraception. And there's probably some theoretical benefit, but it adds to surgeries. However, for many women, if they're done their childbearing at a much earlier age than their age range that's recommended for their risk-reducing surgery, this might be a reasonable option for some birth control and potentially um, feeling like something is being done in the interim before removal of their ovaries, since we know removal of the ovaries will put someone in early surgical menopause. It's important at your preoperative visits to discuss with your surgeon options for hormone replacement therapy. If you are someone that's an unaffected carrier that does not have a hormonally sensitive cancer, it is safe and appropriate to give you back hormone replacement therapy, typically given until the average age of menopause, which currently in the US is about the age of 51. There are various ways to give hormone replacement therapy. It's important to know that if you still have a uterus, you need both the estrogen, which is the important component of the hormone replacement therapy, but you also need some form of progesterone to protect the lining of the uterus from getting a uterine cancer, which is a risk of taking just estrogen alone or too much estrogen. It's important to have this conversation with your surgeon ahead of time, because in some facilities and institutions, you can actually discuss placing a progesterone-based IUD into the uterus, which is a small T-shaped device that gives progesterone just locally inside the uterus. And this can be done during surgery at the completion of the case. That saves people an office procedure that may have some cramping or discomfort associated with it, and allows sort of rapid onset of use of hormone replacement therapy. So while there are no large national trials that include thousands and thousands of women, there has been data that has looked at women who have a BRCA mutation and the safety and acceptability of giving back hormone replacement therapy. And that data to date has not shown that hormone replacement therapy increases cancer risks for patients with, for instance, a BRCA mutation. What it does do is mitigate some of the risks of early surgical menopause, which while we know we are giving people a very significant decrease in their cancer risk reduction, we understand that that comes at the cost of surgical menopause which can include things like uh, you know, menopausal symptoms, hot flashes, vaginal dryness, mood disturbances, sleep disturbances. But importantly for your medical providers, long-term medical risks that you may not feel right away, such as things like risks of heart disease, risk of low bone density or osteoporosis leading to fractures, interestingly, an increased risk of dementia, so there are some real risk factors we have to balance here. And that's why many providers certainly look to the data that's been studied to show that there is benefit to continuing hormone replacement even after risk-reducing surgery. So as a GYN oncologist, I do feel strongly that you should be seeing a GYN oncologist to discuss your risk-reducing surgery. And that's because it's important to have a very informed discussion about cancer risk, what ovarian cancer looks like, and the people who treat ovarian cancer are GYN oncologists. It's also important to note that part of the consent form that at least I discuss with patients is for a possible cancer staging, meaning the first thing I do when I do a cancer risk-reducing surgery is take a good look around at everything in the abdomen and pelvis and make sure there's no findings that are concerning for a cancer. As someone who's a cancer surgeon, you are much more attuned to even sort of very small areas that might raise your concern. We do know that there's data to show that for women who are undergoing risk-reducing surgery, there's anywhere from a one to even five, six, eight, nine percent chance of finding cancer at the time of your risk-reducing surgery. 
Now that may just be microscopic once you get your final pathology report back. Does also, that risk does tend to increase when you're doing risk reducing surgery on patients who are older, as we know that that risk increases when you're older. But it's still really important to discuss that and to know that and to have surgery with a surgeon, if able, who can manage that if that's what's found at the time of your surgery. Now, we certainly know that GYN oncologists are not available necessarily to everybody easily across the country. So then we feel like it's important to have a discussion and have surgery with someone who certainly is very comfortable doing surgery. So it would be definitely a gynecologist, um, but you would want to make sure and questions to ask of any surgeon when you're having surgery is how many patients do you see generally for this type of reason and for this type of surgery? And it's always important, no matter what kind of surgical procedure you're having, to try to find someone who certainly is comfortable talking about what we might find at surgery, comfortable talking about what needs to be done at surgery and comfortable with frequently doing this type of procedure. That does tend to be a general gynecologist as well, if you do not have access to a GYN oncologist. At that point, it is very important to have a consultation with a gynecologic oncologist. Things that might be discussed is certainly at least imaging to see if there's any cancer that's seen anywhere else in the chest and the lungs and the abdomen and the pelvis. Many people may even discuss going back for that second staging surgery. And certainly, typically, chemotherapy at that point is recommended. The chemotherapy that's given for an ovarian cancer or fallopian tube cancer is a very standard type of chemotherapy. And that recommendation should be the same no matter who you see, and that chemotherapy can certainly be delivered by a medical oncologist locally to you if that's more accessible. But I would advocate that you should at least have a consultation at some point at that initial diagnosis with a GYN oncologist. So we know that after you've had your risk-reducing surgery, you've done the most that you can possibly do to decrease your cancer risk. We can never tell anyone that their cancer risk is now entirely zero. There are very few things that are zero or 100% in medicine, but certainly that risk reduction has been dramatic for you. The recommendations for surveillance after risk-reducing surgery is to remain up to date with annual GYN visits. That can certainly be done with your regular gynecologist. Important things to keep in mind at those visits is any symptoms that might be concerning for a cancer that can happen inside the belly. It is, it is very rare, but there have been cases of people developing what looks like an ovarian cancer under the microscope, but they've already had their fallopian tubes and ovaries removed, something called a primary peritoneal cancer. Symptoms of that are symptoms that are consistent with ovarian cancer, bloating, pain, new problems with the bowels or bladder. So making sure that you're up to date with annual health care and consideration of getting pelvic exams at the time of your annual well women visits is very important. There does not currently appear to be a role for ultrasound or any blood work for surveillance. If uh, you are having your risk-reducing surgery prior to your menopause, it's also very important to discuss how frequently and when you should screen with a DEXA scan to evaluate your bone density for those long-term risks like we talked about of osteoporosis. You know, I think it's always good to have either your primary care doctor or even a cardiologist if you have a strong family history of heart disease to be routinely managing things like checking your cholesterol. Um, it's important to make sure that from just a general cardiac health lifestyle that you participate in daily exercise up to 30 minutes a day of even just walking, have a heart healthy diet 
weight-based exercising is really important for women to reduce their risk of osteoporosis. So those are the really important lifestyle interventions that are actually incredibly helpful, even if you haven't had early surgical menopause, but certainly can be the things that you can do from a lifestyle standpoint to potentially mitigate or at least identify some of those risks like heart disease, which is the number one killer in women in general. There are multiple trials that are ongoing currently, including here at Penn, um, evaluating either uh, surgical options for uh, risk-reducing surgery. We've completed the WISP trial um, and currently have an ongoing clinical trial for women who have a BRCA mutation, uh, again, to evaluate the risks and sort of symptom burden of surgical menopause um, with the option for interval removal of the fallopian tubes called salpingectomy with delayed removal of the ovaries. Um, that is not a randomized clinical trial, but it is following patients who have made that decision for themselves personally of the strategy that they'd like to approach their risk-reducing surgery with. We also have ongoing efforts from a basic science standpoint to try to see if there are things like brushings of the fallopian tubes that can identify precancerous lesions, circulating tumor DNA in the blood that might identify these. These are currently ongoing trials led by Dr. Ronnie Drabkin, who leads our ovarian cancer research center here. So there are many folks working hard to find different solutions uh, to this problem to try to see if there are ways to have some sort of surveillance, have some sort of earlier identification to change ultimately these management strategies uh, for women with a genetic risk of ovarian cancer.